tell you about a project started at Observatoire de la Côte d'Azur by the ERC-funded project team Kernel, whose objective is to assist with the direct detection and spectral characterization of extrasolar planets with a recently developed technique called Kernel Nulling Interferometry. In 1978, Ronald Bracewell, Australian-born physicist, publishes a letter in the scientific journal Nature that introduces an intriguing idea. It seems indeed possible to directly detect the light from an extrasolar planet by using a spinning infrared interferometer in space. Here's the gist of the idea. Take two optical telescopes and point them toward a star believed to host one or more planets. These two telescopes, separated by a distance b, form what is referred to as an interferometric baseline. The beams collected by these telescopes are gathered in a place chosen such that the optical path difference along the two arms of the interferometer are of the same length. If these conditions are verified, then thanks to the coherence properties of light, it will be possible to observe interference fringes. To understand Bracewell's intention, it is useful to represent what happens to the electric field collected by the two observing stations. The two fields, labeled E1 and E2, represented by a red and a blue arrow, are coupled into a device called a nuller that makes it possible to overimpose the two fields. To manufacture such a device, several technologies are available. One could use an old school beam splitter or go for a more modern X junction in a single mode photonic device. Whatever the technology, the nuller will produce two outputs. The electric fields can conveniently be described by a sinusoid. If the interferometer is well-tuned, the two fields coming from a single source and collected by the two stations are in phase. The sum of the two perfectly coherent field E1 plus E2 is sent toward a bright output. The intensity would measure there, using either a single photodiode or multiple pixels of a camera, would be proportional to the square modulus of that resulting field. For the second output, the combiner introduces a pi phase shift, that is half a period, to the electric field E2. The two fields, now with opposite phases, cancel each other, leading to an intensity equal to zero. In this so-called dark output, where the light of a star has been cancelled, one will look for the weak signals associated to a potential off-axis companion. How does the light of an off-axis source mix it down this dark output then? Well, if a source is off-axis, its light will reach the two telescopes at slightly different times. With the two electric fields now out of phase, the nuller no longer really works. However, if you move the source a little further away, the field can resynchronize and the nuller starts to work again. One expects this cycle to repeat several times until the phase offset introduced by the off-axis is so large that the interferences are no longer possible. The overall transmission of such a system will resemble that of a comb that only lets through the light of objects placed along the bright stripes. These stripes are regularly spaced by a distance that depends on the ratio between the wavelength lambda and the baseline length b. The orientation of that comb is perpendicular to the baseline between the two telescopes. Cancelling the light on axis at any time, the nuller transmits the light of 50% of the rest of the field of view. By spinning the interferometer, the comb scans the field of view, and except for the on-axis star that remains blocked by the nuller, each region of the field of view is eventually transmitted and the light of a potential companion will find itself coupled into the dark output of the nuller. If the star hosts a companion, one will be able to observe a modulation of the intensity measured in the dark output. And from the number of oscillations and the overall phase of that modulation, one will be able to constrain the position of that companion. The rejection of the light of the on-axis star by the nuller is extremely sensitive to the quality of the tuning of the interferometer. 
atmospheric perturbations for ground-based telescopes, vibrations or disturbance in the attitude of the space telescopes will introduce spurious phase offsets between the two beams. And some of the onaxis very bright starlight will therefore leak and find itself coupled into the dark outputs, which makes it more difficult to detect the considerably fainter planetary signals. But this apparent design flow does not just affect a nulling combiner. Phase measurements made by conventional constructive interferometry in the optical or in the radio are also affected by search perturbations. Yet one knows that it is possible to recover part of the otherwise lost information when the interferometer simultaneously uses at least three sub-apertures. On this example, the three baselines formed by the three telescopes are all affected by perturbations. One can, however, observe that the recorded perturbations are coupled. The phase offset affecting any telescope will indeed simultaneously affect two measurements. These coupled effects make it possible to find combinations of measurements called closure phases in this context that are not affected by the perturbations. We will see how one can take advantage of such coupled perturbations in the context of a nuller. Our proposal exploits a four-telescope interferometer. The electric fields collected by the four apertures are injected into a more sophisticated version of the nuller that produces four outputs. The first collect the four fields in phase, the intensity is maximal. For the three other outputs, the combiner ensures that there are two out of the four fields which are pi phase shifted like in the Bracewell scenario. Three distinct combinations are possible so that three distinct signals can be produced by one such nuller. In the Bracewell scenario, we've seen that the overall shape of the on-sky transmission map depends on the spacing of the telescopes and orientation of the baseline. It is the same with four telescopes, but each output produces a different map featuring more complex structures thanks to the richer interferometric array. The configuration represented here is for the four 8-meter telescopes of the VLTI, which are laid out as shown here. These transmission maps were computed for a wavelength of 3.6 microns. The three maps are different. Each dark output brings a distinct constraint about the presence of a potential companion somewhere in the field. One commonality with the Bracewell COM is that these maps are symmetrical. Involving more telescopes does not make the perturbation problem go away. In the presence of phase-induced perturbations, some of the on-axis starlight will find itself coupled into the dark outputs, and at any instant it will be impossible to know whether the intensity measured on the dark output comes from an astrophysical feature or an instrumental perturbation. Our solution adds a second stage to the nuller that takes the three dark outputs and performs further pairwise mixing operation, detailed here for dark outputs number one and number two. To get something useful out of these two outputs, we'll first add a pi over two phase shift to output number two, which will result in the following arrangement of the four electric fields. We will repeat the process with the same two outputs but this time it is output 1 that will be shifted by pi over 2, resulting in a new arrangement of the four electric fields. One will repeat the process for all possible pairs of dark outputs, which leads to the formation of six distinct remixed dark outputs for our modified nuller. Now these remixed outputs naturally go by pairs. We'll see what happens when looking at the first pair. Observe the symmetry in the reorganization of the arrows that represent the four fields. You could get from one to the other by flipping the diagram over the diagonal dashed line, which would swap the green and yellow arrows. This symmetry will have consequences for the transmission maps of the modified nuller computed here again for the VLTI configuration. Unlike any of the maps you've seen thus far, individual maps 
are no longer symmetric relative to the center of the field, which means that a single snapshot with a modified nuller will already give a stronger constraint on the properties of a potential companion. The anti-symmetry of the reorganization of the electric fields for the two modified outputs actually results in transmission maps that are themselves anti-symmetric. A quick 180 degree rotation of one of the maps makes that quite obvious. However, the real advantage of the proposed architecture will become obvious when we see how it reacts to the presence of perturbations. The total intensity only depends on the relative phase differences between the fields. One takes the electric field E1, represented by the red arrow, as the reference. One can therefore rotate both plots by 45 degrees clockwise so that the E1 field is oriented with the real horizontal axis of the complex plane. The equation describing the intensity recorded by the output is equal to the square norm of the sum of the four fields to which one will add the incoherent intensity induced by the presence of a potential off-axis structures at any time. With the arrows thus aligned, one can further detail this sum. The four fields share the same amplitude A, but point in opposite directions. The result of such a sum is of course zero. Perturbations will result, like before, by spurious phase offsets between the four fields. Since we've taken the field E1 as a reference, it doesn't move in our plot. If perturbations remain small, we can use a first-order Taylor expansion of the complex phasers for the other fields. The norm of the induced perturbation can be written as follows. Further simplifications to this equation lead to the following quadratic equation. But thanks to the aforementioned symmetry properties of the arrangements of the four electric fields, the norm of the perturbation for output number two is identical. This is a very interesting property. Whereas they produce distinct signals, the two outputs simultaneously experience the same perturbation. It is therefore possible to suppress entirely this perturbation by subtracting the two consecutive outputs of the modified nuller. Doing so produces observables robust to small phase perturbations, also known as kernels. Let us represent again the two transmission maps for the modified dark outputs 1 and 2. The subtraction of the two maps results in the formation of a new transmission map for the first of our kernel outputs. The kernels, thus produced, share the two key properties of the traditional closure phase used in constructive interferometry. Number one, the signals are anti-symmetric. Any signal in a kernel output is going to be a sign of a symmetry for the observed target. Number two, the signal recorded in the same outputs are going to be insensitive to perturbations, even if they are here of second order. The proposed architecture is therefore able to produce measurements featuring the desired properties for the closure phase, but that are adapted to the high contrast detection scenario. Let us review how the proposed architecture operates. Our four fields are recombined in a four-beam nuller. The dark outputs of this all-in-one nuller are remixed in a second stage that produces six distinct outputs whose signals are simultaneously recorded and timestamped by a detector. At any instant, the difference between the signals of consecutive outputs produces a kernel, a high contrast observable that is insensitive to instrumental perturbations. Perturbations, we've seen, result in non-desired phase offsets that affect the couple field before they interfere inside the nuller. If one were to plot what happens to these nuller intensities in the presence of perturbation, one would typically observe distributions that look like what is being represented here. In the presence of perturbations, very little time is actually spent near the expected null value, 
that is marked by the dashed vertical lines. And to figure out what is the true null value in this scenario, while possible, requires a fairly sophisticated post-processing statistical analysis. If one were to look at the distributions of the row intensities recorded by the modified nuller, the overall behavior is the same. We now just have six outputs instead of the previous three. Things are, however, very different if one looks at the distributions of the kernels built from the same measurements. We now see three symmetric distributions centered on the expected null value characterized by a standard deviation that is considerably smaller than with the raw observables. This robustness of the observable quantities has two practical consequences. For a given amount of upstream stability, a kernel nuller will naturally outperform a Bressel nuller with the same number of telescopes. And to reach a desired contrast objective, a kernel nuller will make it possible to relax some of the tolerances on the control of the interferometer, so that space high contrast interferometry missions like TPF and Darwin that were eventually cancelled become relevant again. In the year 2020, the kernel team is preparing to integrate and test the first ever kernel nuller prototype that was manufactured as an integrated optics device. For this, we are teaming up with the company Bright Photonics that oversees the manufacturing of a component that followed our specifications. Now, this work is only beginning, but results are to be expected before the end of the year 2020. In the meantime, if you are intrigued, you are encouraged to take a look at the following publication that describes in greater details the architecture of the kernel nuller and will give you an idea of the scientific potential for such a combiner at the focus of the European VLTI. So stay tuned and thank you for your attention.